Um, we're going to take a dive in this hour into the future of health and medicine across a whole sphere of, of realms. You know, it's a really, I think, interesting time across healthcare, uh, anti-aging and beyond, where we can apply technologies, some of which have never been in the healthcare realm, uh, to health and medicine from a variety of different lenses, from health and prevention, keeping healthy, uh, to the future of many of what you do, functional medicine and beyond, more personalized, smart, early diagnosis, the future of therapy, which is getting more tuned and precision and personalized, how we can democratize healthcare with global health, and finally discovery, how all of us as clinicians and our patients can play a role in, in discovery and improving everything from clinical trials uh, to crowdsourcing uh, healthcare. But before we sort of go into the future, it's always a bit of fun to go uh, back to the future. Uh, you might remember that just last month was sort of back to the future day. If you remember that movie, I'm still waiting for my hoverboard. Uh, and the Cubs almost made it into the pennant. Um, you know, but when you look at the future from the lens of the past, it's sort of an interesting uh, element. And I come from the Bay Area, California, where uh, in California where Kaiser Healthcare System started. Back in the 1950s, they made this little movie about what they thought the future of health medicine and the uh, hospital of the future was going to look like. Take a quick look. A medical dream comes true under the drive of industrialist Henry Kaiser, who holds the plans of the ultra-modern hospital designed by Dr. Sidney Garfield, director of the Kaiser Foundation. From the admissions office on, everything is streamlined and expedited. The patient's record reaches the doctor before he does. This is the last word in a combination X-ray machine and fluoroscope imported from Holland at a cost of $25,000. Every portion of the body through 180 degrees can be photographed. In the operating room, the first light of its kind is installed. No portion of an operation is ever in shadow. Nor is the expectant father forgotten. Here he can get the news officially and suffer under the most comfortable circumstances possible. And for mother, well, she has only to call for her baby, and baby comes sliding through a wall in a draw-like bassinet for a little visit with the new mother. In this $2 million institution, doors are opened by remote control, and on the single floor, patients are easily moved from place to place. Dream grounds for a dream hospital. The answer to a doctor's prayer. The answer to a doctor's prayer is maybe not the patient's prayers. I'm sure all your medical facilities have hot tubs and swimming pools for the docs. Um, but I, I had a chance myself to go back to the future recently. I, I went to medical school at Stanford. I did my residency in internal medicine and pediatrics in Boston. And I was back at Mass General Hospital for its 200th anniversary. So we had a chance to have a reunion with the house staff I trained with. Uh, I know a bunch of you are physicians. And remember those little, uh, when we were real residents before those 80-hour work week restrictions? So of course, we could uh, joke about walking uphill both ways in the snow in Boston. And I found myself after one of the receptions one night in the old original building of Mass General uh, in one of the most famous spots of healthcare history called the Ether Dome. And it's called the Ether Dome because back in 1846, the patient in this very picture was the very first to get general anesthesia with his surgery. Uh, before that, they used to bite the bullet. <laughs> I think before this uh, picture, this picture is clearly before, before HIPAA laws. Uh, but if you go back and visit the Ether Dome today, it's pretty much frozen in time from 1846. You can see the same sponge that they had the ether in, the instruments in the back of the room. We have some special grand rounds there and M&Ms, but pretty much a shrine to medical history. We, it's fun to visit. I encourage you to go there. Um, I then wandered down the hall about four minutes away to the ward where I spent my first month as a terrified young intern in, in the mid-1990s, and to my shock and dismay, that was also frozen in time. Um, some, uh, some of the same nurses, uh, some of the same patients. Um, only difference was the poor intern on call was pushing around a eight-year-old laptop, had to type out the electronic medical record, print it out, and the front desk there, still using the cutting-edge medical communication tool of our day, the fax machine, to communicate like one floor down to the pharmacy. And my thought was, even at a pretty renowned, forward-thinking uh, institution like Mass General, healthcare is still being practiced in old silos and old ways of thinking, some of which go back to 1846 and beyond. And I'm sure in your practices and, and other realms, you're seeing sort of old models and old ways of thinking. And, and part of my goal for this session is to get you thinking outside of the normal realm, how we can unsilo healthcare, how we can start to reimagine elements of of, of health and medicine from anti-aging and beyond, outside of the usual sort of bucket of body parts and subspecialties in new ways and move from our sort of, you know, sick care equation to a more health care realm. Because if you think about our, our sick care equations today and the way, the way the systems are built, they're very much intermittent and reactive. 
Uh, we get data occasionally from our patients, whether it's a blood pressure, an EKG, uh, maybe their lab values faxed into you from home. Um, we're therefore re re mostly reactive. We wait for the heart attack or the stroke or the lump to be discovered at, at stage three or stage four.